Okay. Uh, but our next speaker is the co-founder and CEO of Oblong Industries, and he has done some groundbreaking, phenomenal work in innovating uh, computer graphics technology and large-scale visual techniques. He is here with us today to speak with us about how the future of user interface is the future of computation. He's been science advisor on films from Minority Report to The Hulk to Iron Man, which is one of my personal favorites. So I ask that in our intimate group tonight, you give a very warm and welcoming applause, a campus party round of applause, to Mr. John Underkoffler. Thank you. Look at you. The 20 of you are like the hardy survivors of one of Camille's cyber warfare apocalypses. You're strong enough to still be here. It's fantastic. What I'd like to talk about tonight is actually something that I regard potentially as an element of, uh, of her peace initiative, although this is not my slide. This is a good one, though. The inventiveness of men and women shall be consecrated to this life. Stand by. So I am going to talk tonight, uh, exactly as was advertised, about the way in which the future of UI is not only indistinguishable from the future of computation, but is the catalyst and the nutrition through which this will be accomplished. Uh, and UI is such a critical thing to talk about, and yet is so little discussed today for a number of reasons that we'll get into. But let's start with a few assertions. First off, the world is a complicated place. Uh, all of us are professionals in one regard or another. You're either studying professionally or you've finished that and you, you have some job and you're working. And to the extent that that work takes place in the physical world and involves other human beings, that work is complex. It requires sophisticated tools, period. The next step is to acknowledge that uh, all work these days is circumscribed by com computation, by digital tools. The computer touches everything that we do. It's now so intimate with us um, that it's never more than a centimeter from our skin and so forth. So to the extent that you have work uh, and to the extent that you use computers to engage in your work, your work is completely circumscribed by the user interface. The user interface defines what you can and cannot do in your work. Because for us as human beings, the UI is all there is. It's the only part of the computer that you can see and feel and touch and manipulate and affect. And yes, there's a CPU and yes, there's a network, but you don't see and feel and touch those things directly. You have only the user interface. And that is the sense in which I mean the UI is the whole computer for us. So if all of that is true, uh, then exactly as I already said, the UI is either a limitation on your work, because the UI defines what you're able to do and what you're able to say to the machine, or it can amplify and accelerate and enhance your work. That's a simple conclusion. Uh, and from there, if we also assert that nothing big has happened to the UI in 30 years, and I should pause here to say, I'm not talking about the UI of some individual application, the lowercase UI. I'm talking about uppercase UI, the set of elements and design principles um, from which you draw and assemble the pieces for some particular application's UI. So these are the pull-down menus and the way the mouse interacts with overlapping windows and little clicky buttons and the rest of it. That's what we have. That's the alphabet. That's the vocabulary. That's what we build everything else out of. And that has not changed in 30 years. So you can look at that as a lament, as a Jeremiah, or you can look at it as an opportunity to do something better. Because assuming that we're not stuck with the same UI we've had for the last 30 years, for the next 100, we ought to be working on the better one. Let's try one more time. And to do this, to sort of frame the entire set of ideas, I want to ask something that's going to be absolutely ridiculous. It'll seem meaningless. We could ask, what UI does your organization use? That's meaningless because there's only one to choose from. It's the Macintosh UI from 1984. It's what we've still got on all of our laptops and all of our desktops. If we could make another one and it were better, or it were better in some ways, or it were better for some applications, then we could ask this question. So it's useful to keep all of that uh, in mind. So if we're going to build a new UI, a big uppercase UI, a new one, how can we figure out what it should look like? One thing we might try is to look at the history of UI and connect this point and this point and draw a line through it, or maybe it's a curve, and see if we can predict what's out there. Of course, that's not going to work. 
but I'm going to waste your time with it anyway. So to do that, let's take a look at the complete history of modern user interface. Here it is. Step one was uh, a big moment, and it was the change from scarcity to abundance. The scarcity in, let's say, the mid-60s or early 1970s was that if you wanted to play with a computer, uh, you could only get at one, maybe at a university, maybe at a large company. You had to sign up for time, probably. You maybe signed up for a half-hour slot in which you had access to it. If you were really, really lucky, it was a time-sharing system, and you could use it for more than half an hour. But basically, there was a very, very small number of per capita computers. Then all of a sudden, we got this. <clears throat> uh, 1977, this happens to be my own personal Apple II Plus, and it doesn't matter if it's the Apple or an Atari 800, or if you lived in the UK, you might have had a Sinclair ZX80 or Radio Shack produce the TRS-80. They all happened at the same time, and what they represented was the shift from one computer for many people to a single computer for a single person. And so, for the first time, if you really felt like it, you could drink a lot of coffee and stay up for 10 days straight and just program, just be one with the computer. And that shift allowed new kinds of things to happen. It allowed uh, new fields to open. It allowed people like Dan Gorlin to write Choplifter, in some sense the first blockbuster video game uh, that sold over a million copies. And there was no internet, so you sent Dan a check, and he sent you a floppy disk, and then you had this game, and then you could waste a week or two playing it. Uh, that was a big moment. Herbie Hancock and others uh, used this machine, which, remember, had only 48 kilobytes of memory and a 1 megahertz 6502 processor, should have been incapable of doing pretty much anything. But Herbie Hancock used this machine to invent much of the modern era of uh, electronic audio and uh, digitally, uh, digitally mediated music composition, production, and performance. And two guys in a garage in Cambridge, Massachusetts, Bricklin and Frankston, wrote and invented the electronic spreadsheet. Now, this wasn't uh, a matter of a slight tweak or an improvement on something that existed. This was the wholesale creation of a new category. Previously, uh, if you wanted to perform accounting or financial operations, you probably did it by hand in a ledger that, in terms of its spatial layout, was the inspiration for the spreadsheet. But the fact that you could suddenly do it, that everyone could do it, electronically, move around cells, connect cells with formulas, and so forth was, was mind-blowing. Uh, it was such a, 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 an important moment, actually, that, uh, that people had to have the software. And because it only ran on this computer at first, that software multiplied sales of this bit of hardware by a factor of 10, something like that. So that was an incredible moment. All of this despite what today would look like impossible limitations. OK, there's only one more step in UI. Uh, and that's when we go from the command line interface to the GUI. The command line interface, you type words in, words come out, maybe there's a little bit of graphics. There's certainly no standardization around the graphics, and the UI is basically lexical. It's tickling the language and the, uh, the abstraction and the logic parts of your brain, um, not all of which are, are that big. Then in 1984, this happens. The Macintosh gives the world the graphical user interface. And some of the ideas came from Xerox Park earlier and so forth, but in that same sense of abundance, suddenly everyone could use this UI. Uh, and people who weren't inclined to or didn't like to or didn't know how to use a command line interface, which is still a little bit uh, arcane, of course, uh, could suddenly use this. So the machine learned to speak in pictures. It learned to represent its internal state in pictures, and it let you, the user, drag the pictures around to assert some of your meaning, some of your intent. And all of a sudden, it wasn't just the logic and language parts of the brain that were lighting up, but the much bigger human visual system, the part of your brain that understands the world around you from visual images, understands space, understands layout, understands spatial relationships. That makes this thing a very, very powerful proposition indeed. So powerful, in fact, that it has now held sway for more than 30 years. One might have thought that we'd get a new one, but we haven't. So this is the last big step in UI. To me, that feels like a very dangerous liability. And the reason is that the machine has gone like this. CPU speeds, storage, the internet, which didn't even exist at the time that this came out, graphics, all the rest of it, has phenomenal capabilities. But we are still talking this kind of rodent language. You know, it's like we're uh, very primitive monkeys at the bottom of the monolith, squeaking and grunting at it. So from the machine's point of view, we're down here. In fact, of course, we're up here, but we have to talk like this. So what we want to do, and the goal of this talk, and the goal of my work at Oblong, is to at least do this. Give people a language that is meaningful, that is expressive,
that allows you to say to the machine what it is that you mean and so that you're not down here grunting and squeaking and clicking anymore. Now, it's not the only steps that have happened in the world of computation. Um, something really important happened in 1994 when my obsession with all this stuff began. And that is that, of course, the internet had come along at large scale a few years before, and someone invented something that made the internet really, really valuable, which was namely the World Wide Web. And we got this. So in one sense, this is a miracle. This is one program, one application, the browser, that can access all of the world's information if it's put in the right format and if it's out there somewhere on the internet. But let's think of this program in terms of its UI. This is a moment, 1995, let's say, when uh, native user interface had gotten really beautiful, really sophisticated, really smooth, uh, really mature, uh, particularly at places like Next Computer, uh, where the next step operating and UI system uh, was, was really leading the charge. Here, we bounced all the way back to the beginning, because the proposition here is, yes, you're going to access the entire world through this one program, and that means, in turn, that the UI is going to be completely controlled by this program. And you can look at it. It's horrible. Right? So we bounced all the way back 10 or 11 years uh, after making a bunch of progress. So we're back to the beginning. And I, I'm going to say that it's only two years ago that the browser's capabilities allow construction of UIs that are as sophisticated as what we had back in the middle and late 90s on the native side. But it's good. We've gotten there. And just as we're getting there, um, we get to step backwards one more time because we get, we get my desktop. Fascinating. There's one more button here than I knew about. We get this. <clears throat> this is tremendous in one regard. We get to take the computer with us. It's always with us. It's touching our skin. We can talk to it. We can fondle it. And let's think about what the UI does. The UI is beautiful. You take this thing out of its box and it sings to you. It, it shows you pictures. It plays movies. It loves, loves, loves you. And you love it even more. But think about what the UI does and what it says philosophically. This is a UI that lets you run only one program at a time. And in that regard, we've gone back not just 10 years, we've gone back to this. Because one of the limitations of this machine is that it runs one program at a time. Think about this sequence. Ta think about yourself using VisiCalc, a spreadsheet. You're doing a bunch of stuff. You're editing cells. You're saving files. You're writing formulas. Now you want to use a word processor. You have to literally shut down the spreadsheet to boot up the word processor. And if you'd invested in an acoustic modem coupler so that you could dial up a BBS, you'd then have to shut down the word processor to get on the BBS. So these things can't touch or talk to each other. What this gave us, the GUI here, was not just a, a simplification. It didn't just make it easier for people to do something. It actually changed the nature of what you could do. Because now you can run all those programs at the same time. You could copy a bunch of cells out of your spreadsheet, paste it into the middle of a word processing document, and take that file and drag it into an email client and send it out of the machine, off over the internet. Those are not just steps that would have been difficult with the earlier command line. They were essentially impossible. And so now we've gone back to that, one program at a time. I know that the new version of iOS lets you run two programs at a time. But really, that philosophical statement is, uh, is not a comfortable one for me. Because what we're saying is that UIs are getting simpler and less capable. We want to go in the opposite direction. We want to build capable interfaces, more capable than we were building in 1994, certainly more capable than we're building now. And really, what we're talking about is getting back to the idea of professional computing. We've been obsessed with building and selling and thinking about toys. Uh, and these are great, beautiful, wonderful toys. But this is and is not capable of different kinds of things. This is not, by and large, capable of professional computing. Tasks of the sophistication that are required to run the 21st century. And that's our business, all of us here, is running the 21st century. So let's build UIs that are appropriate for human beings who have real jobs, real professions, uh, and need professional computing to get at them. So we're going to come at that problem in eight somewhat connected steps. This is not a full answer to all of the questions that I've posed, um, but it is a set of pieces that together, I think, start to build the outline of an answer for what a future UI could look like and a general purpose UI. One, we want to take pixels out of their isolation. We want to take the pixels that today believe that they're purely abstract and are bounded by the physical, you know, the physical form and the physical edges of this device and cannot, therefore, talk to these pixels 
which are being projected from somewhere else and have some other device behind them. We want to break the screens open and let the pixels go everywhere. And when you do that, you get something a little like this. This is a set of prototypes that we built at MIT at the Media Lab starting in the mid-90s. And here, there is no rectangular bezel. There is no device apparent. Instead, we have the room as it existed before the computer was in place. And we've got the possibility for the first time of taking pieces of the physical world, like this vase, like this container, and attaching pieces of the digital world to it. Little bits of text and live video and images and numbers. And now we've accomplished digital storage in a physical container. That has uh, a number of advantages, which is that you, as a human being, know how that works. You've known how storage in a container works since you were one or two years old. You know that when you move this, the container to a new location and pour it out, the same stuff comes out that went in. And we built a, a bunch of little tricks. So the room knew about chess, and if you gave it a chess board, it would give you pieces to play with, and so on. And then we started building very, very specific engineering applications. This is an optics prototyping workbench. Um, it's very old-style optics CAD, but it does not have a CAD interface. Instead, it has physical models of lasers and lenses and beam splitters and mirrors, and you use your human hands to move them around on the table. You're asking questions of a simulated system, but you're asking them in the physical world which means different parts of your brain are being accessed, and different parts of your brain are in charge of understanding the output. Same idea, a digital wind tunnel fluid simulated, flowing from right to left, not new, but what is new is that you can implicate a piece of the physical world directly in the simulation. And I think you can see, looking at this, that it's probable that new kinds of intuition and new kinds of understanding come out when you're using your most familiar mode of interaction, which is using your human hands, to deal with the physical world, and you've got a digital overlay or underlay. Uh, it's very, very powerful indeed. And a similar system here for urban planners and architects, whom we did a great disservice to when we invented CAD, because we said to architects, no more 3D models. Yes, we know it's a 3D uh, profession, but you're going to sit like this in front of a little screen for the rest of your lives. So this system is an apology that gives people back the physical 3D models that are great, and it makes the computer do the hard work of finding those structures and once you've found them and localized them in space, you can project down things like shadows. So now you can perform intershadowing studies in a very, very intuitive environment. We can use that tool to change the surface of the building from brick, let's say, to something shiny like metal or glass. And now we can worry about glare, about the effect that blinding people uh, driving on the highway might have and what the effects of rotating the building might be in solving that problem and so forth. So this was a series of experiments. Um, that, uh, that convinced me and others that it was possible to build new kinds of UI, that it was possible to build UI that would let humans manipulate digital systems in a much more familiar, much more intuitive, and much more powerful way. So what lessons have we learned? We can de-abstract the pixels, put pixels in the physical world. Those were real-world pixels. They were absolutely in the room with you, with the other objects, with the furniture, with the walls, with the rest of it. And when the systems behind those pixels understand that, something very good happens. And the other point is, let people use their hands. When you use a mouse, you take this, which is a beautiful instrument for understanding the world and making the world, and you do this. You clutch it about around a bunch of plastic, and now you might as well not have a hand. It's not very useful as a hand, so drop the mouse, use your hands for what they were intended. Two, we encapsulated this at Oblong uh, in an operating system, in a programming stack, a software stack, called GSpeak. And we'll get to Minority Report later. Uh, because that's obligatory, but this is the real-world version of the Minority Report operating system. And I'm compelled to say that this is not visual effects, this is real. And if you come to our laboratory in Los Angeles, you can see this and play with it just like this. So it has gloves, like Minority Report. And now you can step back from a screen, you can step back from many screens, and by pointing, get at anything, because pointing is an amazing human gesture. It lets you indicate distant objects. And so that was the first thing we needed to teach the machine. Navigation in two dimensions around abstract or very literal uh, data sets like that high-resolution image are interesting. There's free space gesture, and then you can get close to a surface and have different kinds of effects. And then, of course, there's touch, where you have the advantage of frictional contact to let your hand know where it is and what it's doing. Sometimes you want to reach out and grab a chunk of data and pull it toward you and spin it around. This is how we already understand the physical world. You pick up objects, you move them around, you understand their shape, their form, and their intent. Sometimes we have physical pixels like this, and they have to respond to the same gestural language. And just as important as pointing is navigation. 
So there's a 25-year history, very venerable, very impressive, of uh, data visualization using computer graphics, but it's always been brittle, it's always been frozen and dead. Even if it moves around, the fact that you can't navigate around it means you're only using one piece of your brain. If you give people a way to fly through it, then it's like walking through the world. It's like learning a neighborhood, learning a city by moving through it. I'm going to skip ahead. We built a lot of prototypes uh, like that, but the thing that we did that made this all possible is that for the first time, we built a programming language or an operating system like GSpeak that understands space and time. For those of you who are programmers, and I assume some of you are, think about any programming language in the world, your favorite one, guaranteed they don't have space as a first-class construct. You can't talk about the real world of space and coordinates. And only one language that I know of called Chuck for working with music understands time. So we put that in as a foundational set of principles. Every program now knows about space and time, the four most important dimensions we have as humans, because that's where all the action is. And therefore, the machine has the opportunity to know about us. Three, it's a very strange historical legacy and liability of all the computers that we have been building for the last 30 years. And even though we don't call it a computer, we know that this is one, um, that the computation and the pixels and the interaction and the UI and the applications and everything else stops at the physical boundaries. And yet this thing has a network. The network is the most important part of everything that we're doing. So that's a strange phenomenon that both seems self-evident, but it only seems self-evident because it's been that way so long and we haven't questioned it. If we question it and say, well, what if the UI could escape out the edge of this? What if the pixels could extend notionally? What would happen then? Then you would end up with something like this. This is a tiny little G-Speak program that lets you move a piece of media around five different screens of different sizes, being driven by three different computers, running two low-level operating systems, and it doesn't matter. What does matter is that it's all conformed in space and time, and as a human organism, you get what you want and you get what you expect, which is that everywhere there's pixels, you get your data, and you can move it around and you can manipulate it, and this doesn't care whether it's Windows or OS X or Linux underneath, and in fact, it's all of them. And these are the kinds of principles we need when we build the future. Similar set of uh, demonstrations in which we're taking a little digital artifact, a, a digital L system tree, pulling it from one operating system running on a laptop to another driving a huge display, pulling another one back. Uh, Microsoft Kinect sensor is in charge of understanding the large scale motions. A leap motion sensor there is understanding the fine grained motions that let you manipulate the object. And so what we've built is continuity continuity of the application, of the data, of the experience, of the UI, and of the input, even as it moves across different kinds of pixels, different kinds of low-level input devices. And so this is a principle we have to use from now on when we build systems. Assume that there are no boundaries. And someone, uh, Oblong and others, will do the hard work of building programming environments where that's taken care of. That's tricky stuff, but once it's done once, then the rest of the world can get on to building applications like that. Four, we need to uh, increase the expressiveness and the meaning content in the UI elements themselves. If you think what happens when you use a mouse, you're taking a little arrow, which is actually pointing at a zero-dimensional spot. It's pointing at a single pixel, one XY location. So zero dimensions creeping around a two-dimensional screen that has a hard limit of a rectangular boundary at the edges, which you can't move off of. And that zero-dimensional point is the entire representation of you. That's what the computer thinks of you. It's all you have, it's all you're given. Uh, and that in turn is a metaphor. That's, that's a strong statement about what you do and don't get to do. We can build much more expressive versions of that same idea. Ex versions that aren't zero dimensional, that don't show you just where you are, that also might show you where you could go. What are the three things that could happen next if you do this or this or this? And we're just beginning, but I'll show you a few examples. So this set of concentric circles with some additional pieces is an output glyph and an input glyph that allows you to see what's happening as you move and scale an object at the same time. Uh, it's using the kind of coincidence of the circles to depict engagement. It turns uh, linear motion as you push into rotational motion, which is a nice trick when you can get away with it. As you see there, as soon as the circles overlap, then they begin to spin. And it shows you, it gives you an output representation of how far you've pushed in or come back. And it gives you little triangular ears on the side to say that you might, uh, you might skim the whole thing left and right. Again, this is just the beginning, but if we build UI elements that 
express uh, not only what you're doing, but also express what the machine is doing, give you a glimpse into what the machine thinks you're doing and what the machine thinks might happen next, that can be a really amazingly powerful set of principles, right? It's like a quantum future predictive bit of UI um, where you can actually see why the machine, why the program made a mistake interpreting you. It can, because you saw what you were doing, but you also saw how it understood that, which means that you and the machine can actually get closer. You can engage in a tighter feedback loop uh, just because of that on-screen representation. So we want to render causality. There's no causality in that little arrow. We can show cause and effect as elements in the UI. And it doesn't have to be didactic. It doesn't have to be pedantic. It can be very subtle. And ideally, it's so subtle that it's the kind of thing that you stop noticing. But you still pick it up subliminally. I'm going to skip over most of this. Um, but I do want to suggest that for those of you who are programmers, you know that the people who write programming languages have basically never read a book because they only use about eight words, maybe 12 words, to express the entirety of concepts that you're supposed to be able to use when you program. There's set, and there's get, and there's six more words, and that's it. And that's a shame because, of course, we have all of human language, and we have multiple languages to access uh, and to, to construct meaning and metaphor out of. Uh, at Oblong, most of the metaphors inside G-Speak come from the biological world, which I think is a, an important choice, right? What's, what's the source of your metaphor? The metaphor for most of computer science through most of its history is mechanical. It's very 19th century. It's very telegraph. It's very point to point. One thing talks to one other thing and has no understanding of anything that's going on to the side. If you consider what happens in biology by comparison, it's not point to point. It's kind of lots of systems talking to each other all at the same time. So if, for example, um, one part of your body wants to send a signal to another part of the body, it secretes a protein, an endocrine, a hormone, and that starts floating around in your bloodstream. And eventually it gets to the part of your body that was intended to be signaled, but it goes through every other part as well. And maybe your pancreas has evolved to take notice of the signal that was intended for here. So you've got multi-point signaling. And once you start thinking about programming in much more literally fluid terms, not metal and solids, but liquid uh, and endocrine systems, you start working in very, very different ways. And if the tools that you have available to you make that stuff easy, you can build much more sophisticated programs, much more sophisticated systems, much more easily. And to the point of metaphor, Let's take one now. Uh, let's consider ci cinema, the language of cinema. It's about 130 years old. Uh, it is one of the most amazing human languages ever devised, because unlike spoken language, it is brilliant at expressing events that take place in space over time. Uh, trajectories of objects, trajectories of human bodies, trajectories of narrative and of story, <clears throat> trajectories of emotion that have a causal effect. This gives rise to that, and therefore this, and so on. That's an incredibly powerful language, but for 130 years, it has been output only. We take in cinema, but we understand it. By the time each one of us is eight years old, we speak that 130-year-old language. We've absorbed all of the lessons of cinema. It's just that we don't have a way to speak it back. So we built an experiment to see what it would look like if you could actually talk back to cinema, if you could talk back to it on its own terms. And it's very recursive, because what we wanted to manipulate uh, in the system was more cinema. So we took 24 films, uh, a lot of amazing films from a lot of different countries and a lot of different genres, uh, and we give you access to it gesturally. You can skim through every frame of a movie, you can stop on a frame, and then you can start to disassemble the movie. You can pull a prop or a vehicle or a character or some architecture uh, or some environment out of the film, and then you can go to another film and pull an unrelated piece of something out of that film and you start to compose them together on this work table in front of you. Uh, so depending on your temperament, this is either cinematic heresy, we're taking films that weren't meant to go together and we're jamming them together, or this is an important metaphor. And for us at Oblong, this is the most important metaphor. This is a metaphor about efficacy, about agency, about the control that you should have and the ease of access that you should have to your digital stuff. It's not the Apple proposition that you only ever need one button in every application to do everything. This says, no, stuff is, stuff is complex, stuff is sophisticated, but we're going to give you beautiful tools to work with it. 
and we're going to let you touch everything. And the other principle at work there is that the UI doesn't have to be dull. The UI doesn't have to be inert. And in fact, if you build UIs the right way, you know that it's getting where it should be when it's actually exhilarating to use them. When using some system like that starts triggering the parts of your brain that react when you're skiing or playing the saxophone or skydiving or laughing or singing or doing any of those things that's a reminder that you are a mind housed in a physical body. Right, the tingle along your spine that lets you know that you're human. A UI can do that as well, and it should. Not just because it's fun, but because it means you're being more effective, you're being more powerful. And now, uh, the other really, really strange legacy of this drive, the drive from the desktop machine to the laptop to the tablet to this. If you believe the people that sell you these and tablets, this is all you'll ever need. No one quite comes out and says it explicitly, although Steve Jobs came close. The idea is this is great. We take it everywhere. And that's true. But the UI on here, as we've already discussed, is not a step forward. It's a step back. It's less capable. If you're a journalist, I doubt very much that you use this to write your articles. I hope you don't, because a keyboard is actually better for that. So it's a less capable UI. And it has another bit of characteristic, which is that it's small. There's not many pixels. There's not space for UI. There's not space for ideas. This is great for a shopping list when you're at the supermarket or at IKEA or somewhere else. This is not great if you and five colleagues are planning a tricky brain surgery. This is not great if you need to perform finite element analysis on a bridge with your architectural team to make sure that it doesn't fall down. This is not great if you and the city planning commission are trying to figure out what happens when the Pope visits your city and all the traffic is diverted, and how are you going to maintain some semblance of infrastructure still working? The reason it's not great is that it's too small. And I'm going to assert that different kinds of work, different human tasks, different problems, different workflows and work patterns have an innate scale, have a natural scale. And our UIs and our computational devices have to acknowledge that. We have to give people computational environments that are at the right scale for what they need to do. It's not a big mystery, because the place you can immediately look to figure out what the right scale is for any given task is architecture. You build an operating room at a certain size with a certain layout to accommodate a certain number of people and some equipment. You build meeting rooms and conference rooms to accommodate a certain number of people who you know will be doing something. So if you look at different kinds of architectural environments where people work, you start to get an idea for the scale at which digital environments should offer themselves. And in Los Angeles, we have a, a warehouse, partly because we ship equipment all over the world, but partly because we need a large-scale space to prototype large-scale digital environments. And I've just got a, a few quick examples here. These are all prototypes that took between half a day and a day and a half. Uh, this is a, a chunk, uh, uh, maybe 20 square kilometers of Los Angeles. Very low-res, simple depiction of all the buildings that are in that place. Uh, what's important is not the fidelity or the resolution or the rendering of those buildings. What is important is the idea that you can stand in the middle of it and have an environmental understanding of what's going on. We're no longer kind of peering into this tiny, darkened rectangle. We're looking at architectural scale. We're looking at city scale at a representation of a city. And I guarantee you that if we were able to put someone's head inside an fMRI machine while she was using a system like this, you'd see very, very different effects uh, taking place, different neurons lighting up. The scale of understanding that's possible because of the physical scale of the digital environment is a direct correlation. This is a medical imaging case. Um, we spent, uh, this was actually more than a day and a half, we spent a few weeks working with researchers from University of California in San Francisco and the Lawrence Berkeley Laboratories who'd assembled a com composite set of brain scans uh, in their study of degenerative brain diseases like Alzheimer's. Um, and we put it into this environment where you've got a gestural control. You can look at the brain as a whole uh, in the distance. You can also pull it forward so that you're actually inside the brain. And you can see the structures there and understand them as physical objects. And the researchers who'd been working with this data for five years said, we've never really seen this data before. We've had access to it uh, all along, every day for five years, but we haven't been able to understand it this way which goes to the importance of representation, goes to the importance of scale, and goes to the importance of building UIs that think about you first as a human and don't think about you first as the user of a digital system. 
uh, financial data kind of laid out the same way. Instead of an enclosed digital uh, pixel space, we're on a 41-foot-long wall of pixels. Has different properties. Uh, has uh, more of a kind of uh, horizon feel, if you will. But the same principles that you can kind of pull yourself into the data and understand it in an immersive way is at work here. More medical imaging. This is six hours of the development, the fetal development of a quail heart, uh, the heart in, a, in an embryonic bird. And over those six hours, scanning is now good enough that we can track every cell. Uh, and the cells actually migrate over this particular six-hour period. They turn upside down. And so here we're navigating these biological structures in space like this so we can understand the physical form. But we're also able to navigate them in time uh, as that uh, that fetal structure, as that embryonic structure changes and evolves during one of the most critical phases of its development. So here we're actually watching individual cells move around in a developing body. And more experimental uh, uh, advances like this, in which we're taking 365 days uh, of, uh, of retail commercial activity. I don't know what the, what the store was, um, but, but the implication here is that if you can present data the right way and at the right scale and give people a good enough navigational interface to it, it's possible that you can see patterns where it might otherwise believe, be believed that there are no patterns to be observed. So we have to at least be able to pursue that as a possibility. So we have to be able to embrace scale. We have to say, you know what, the next hundred years are not going to look like this in every case. In cases where we want this, we've got it. In cases where you've got a bigger set of problems to deal with, will give you a bigger space, and will give you an, a UI that's appropriate for that larger space. OK, and now's the part um, that we can't escape, because now we have to talk about Minority Report. In the US, uh, when you talk about the future, by law, you must reference this movie. Um, there are severe political uh, and civil consequences for not doing it. I don't want those consequences, so we will discuss Minority Report. Uh, it was a unique uh, moment, a unique chapter in cinematic development. Uh, because the scale of design was bigger than had ever happened before. The director, Steven Spielberg, wanted to know what everything was like in this world. Part of the reason that he wanted that is that there was no story. When we started, on the day that the production designer was hired, that was the same day that the scriptwriter was hired, which means we had no story to design around. We knew we had to build a world that was essentially 360. We knew that Stephen would want to turn his camera in any direction, so that meant literally, physically, the sets had to be 360. But the ideas behind that, our description of the world, had to be 360 as well. We didn't know if the characters would have to go to an airport. We didn't know if the characters would have to go in the subway. We didn't know if characters would have to go to a fashion show. And so we had to design all of that because we didn't yet know what the story was going to be. And that exercise, in turn, allowed us to build a completely seamless world, a world in which a lot of the design had actually been worked out and there were no boundaries. All of these ideas went into a book that we call the Minority Report Bible. Originally, the film was set in 2080, and in it, we tried to capture everything that we thought we knew about what would happen with ecology, advertising, uh, technologies for domestic situations. Can you build surfaces that can become alternately hot and cold so you can cook at high temperature and then do something sous vide a moment later, and so on? personal information technologies that certainly looked cool and futuristic back in 2002. Now they look kind of old. The future gets here faster than we thought it would. Transportation technologies, uh, transport, uh, uh, technologies for, uh, for governments to use, uh, completely fictional technologies uh, like psychic children that float in a milky bath and foresee violent crime all day long, but that's the backbone of the story. And lots of ideas for future systems that just didn't make it into the film like these paparazzi bots that fly around to sporting events and crime scenes uh, and try to get better pictures than each other. Then the date changed on the film, and it would change one more time before it came out. So as the technology advisor, I was responsible for making that all of that tech was seamless and seemed like it had come from our present day, 50 years into the future, uh, in, in a set of natural steps, and didn't feel like it was kind of assembled from seven different incompatible futures. But the biggest job that I had and the biggest challenge was to answer Steven Spielberg's question about what would computers look like in 50 years. And he said, please do not tell me we will still be using a keyboard and mouse. And I thought that was a great thing to hear. And then he loved the idea that, no, it would not be the keyboard and the mouse. Instead, there would be a huge number of pixels, a giant panoramic area in which information could be arrayed. And his characters, his actors, 
could stand and conduct the information as if they were Mickey Mouse on the promontory in Fantasia or as if they were Stokowski or an actual orchestra conductor. Hugely visual, he's a very visual guy. He's working in a visual meeting, medium, film. Uh, and so he liked this idea. So we went to work, we, uh, we researched and then synthesized a new gestural language. Humans have lots and lots of gestural languages, so there's a lot to research. Um, there's just the kind of uh, elusive gesture that we all make when we talk. There is uh, ground air traffic control gestures that we've all seen. There are gestural systems for describing music, which a few of us have seen. Um, there are SWAT team and police gestures and so on. And of course then there's international sign language, which is in incredibly expressive. Out of all of that, we assembled a domain-specific language that these police officers, these forensic pre-crime cops could use to extract enough information from the random data that was coming out of the heads of the precog characters so that they could stop a crime before someone was murdered. And in fact, we went so far as to produce not just uh, printed dictionaries so that the actors could study this language, but we made training videos as well. And this was an incredibly important document because this was the moment when the director saw this, he realized that these wouldn't be embarrassing scenes, that he could actually use this fictional technology to help push the story forward, that he could locate pieces of the narrative actually in this UI. He could tell part of the story, a little piece of the story, through these scenes of technology. So this was about confidence. This was about the idea um, that we wouldn't have to make it up later, that we wouldn't just have Tom Cruise flailing around with no meaning and try to construct something in the editing room. And that was a training document. We spent weeks with the actors, working with them so that they actually knew this language. They were the very first users of G-Speak, even though it didn't exist yet. And so when it came time to shoot, the director would say, okay, in this scene, we want Anderton uh, looking out the window, the reconstructed crime scene window. He's gonna see an architectural detail. That's how he knows what street the crime takes place on. Then he should pull back in through the window. He's gonna pan down. There's the murder weapon, he's found it. And then you would rehearse with the actors for just 30 seconds. You'd say, okay, remember it's two fingers pointing there and down here, and then you push that aside. Then you want to join the two pieces. There will be an automatic comparison. And then the cameras roll. The actors aren't seeing anything on the screens. That's composited in later. But they're actors. They can use their imagination. And what came out, I think, um, embodied a kind of verisimilitude. When audiences watched this back in 2002, okay. I think what was on display was something that looked and felt real. Uh, part of the idea was that it had to explain itself instantly. We couldn't have a scene where someone very slowly explained the technology. You just had to see this and understand it. And once people saw it and, understand it and un understood it, they were able to decide whether this seemed like a good idea or not. And in fact, people were excited enough that this, this was the moment that we decided to put together Oblong as a company, to take this technology that had started in academia at MIT at the Media Lab as a set of prototypes, running code, real, real prototypes, uh, but, but demos, really, that had taken on a new life in fictional form in this film, uh, and to take that and bring it into the real world as actual technologies that could be used by real people with real jobs to solve real world problems. <clears throat> so in some sense, we accidentally undertook the world's largest user focus group test with this movie. We hijacked the Hollywood filmmaking apparatus to give people a glimpse of what UI could be like in 50 years and ask people if it was a good idea or not. What this film shows, and I'm going to now offer a reinterpretation of Minority Report and the, those scenes of gestural technology, is not so much about gesture. That's what people end up writing about a lot and talking about, and that's a piece of it. It's true, but it's not the most important piece. What we're seeing is a demonstration of the idea that the UI can make not just a quantitative difference, the possibility of doing something a little faster, a little better, but a qualitative difference, that a UI makes possible something in these fictional scenes that isn't possible any other way. What we're really saying is that there's no AI here. You don't see any AI in, AI in this film. That was Spielberg's previous film. But here, all you have is really, really capable human beings. You've got the smartest computers in the room that are being augmented with an amazingly capable UI that lets them do a futuristic job. And so I'm gonna wrap up with one last demonstration. This is a system that Oblong uh, makes today and that customers on six continents are using 
Uh, and it embodies what I think is maybe the most important characteristic that is the future of UI. And I'm going to whip out the phone one more time to talk about one last liability, one last little historical strangeness that is connected with the way we've be been building computers. And that is that they're personal computers. That was what it was called at the beginning, a personal computer. And it's for one person at a time. It's just for you. And I could peek over your shoulder and look at your pixels, but I can't use it. It only knows about one person at a time. Each person has their own. That's great. Maybe this is your second brain. This is your electronic brain. You probably have several of them. But the 21st century is going to be characterized by collaboration, by people pro solving problems that are too complex for any one person to solve alone. And so although the physical world is really good at collaboration, the physical world doesn't stop three of us from going up to a whiteboard and making marks on it at the same time. The digital world is all about doing things only one at a time. Only I can use the program. Then I have to give it to you. Then you have to give it to the next person, and so on. If, on the other hand, we could build a UI that understands the value of letting people work at the same time, you might get something like this. So in a mezzanine room, there are screens all over the place. And those screens uh, are public pixels. They're shared pixels. And they're not just for one person at a time. They're for everyone to use simultaneously. So you come into the room with a bunch of devices, your personal devices, your tablets, your smartphones, your laptops, and you start projecting information and applications and data into the shared pixels. And it doesn't matter what you're using. Part of the idea here is it doesn't matter if it's Windows or OS X or iOS or Android. Every device that you have is your connection to the shared pixels. With that connection, you can upload data, you can control the layout of the surfaces and so forth. And what we're doing is producing a shared visual space, a hyper-visual space that works like the physical world. And that means that one of the great properties, properties of the real world is that if we're looking in the same direction, we all see the same thing. And we have to expend no cognitive overhead to worry about that. I know that if you're looking the same way I am, uh, you're going to see the same stuff. And that's very, very valuable. This, finally, is a digital system that has that same basic principle. You bring in people from distant locations, you join the rooms together, and now everyone is sharing the data and the pixels across all the locations, and everyone has simultaneous, parallel, democratic control over those pixels. So that this intensely serialized workflow that computers have taught us is the only way gets exploded, and we turn serial into parallel, we turn linear into nonlinear, and we turn isolation into collaboration. And not all of it is digital either. The whiteboard is great. Everyone knows how it works. No one has to be trained. Uh, and we say, good, we don't need a digital whiteboard. We just need a camera, a digital camera, that can take that whiteboard and ingest it, bring it into the visual conversation. And that's it. This is a room where the computer is architectural and it's shared so that people can work in the way that they already know how to work when they're working with each other in an environment that's not infested with computation. So this is, maybe as much as anything else, a political statement about how it ought to be possible to work. Uh, and this is the kind of future UI that we want, one that thinks about people and lots of people all at the same time. So we want to default to collaboration. Uh, let me wrap it up here by talking about that first syllogism, the thing that happened when we went from the command line interface to the GUI. We got new kinds of capabilities. We went from one program at a time to many programs at a time. I think the extension of that to the next version is that we get not just one device at a time, but we get everyone's devices in the same space. And we get everyone's brains being projected into a visual digital conversation. I think that's a sort of natural extension. Uh, and one way to think about this is that we have to get rid of that kind of cult-like drive to simplicity. That Apple computer, there's just one button. Because as Einstein said, you know, every theory, and in this case, let's call it UI, every UI should be as simple as possible, but not simpler than that. And today, we're down here, where it's impossible to do some kinds of things. We have to come up here so that it's possible for everyone to do whatever it is they think about. So at the end of the day, what we want is a world in which the digital devices that we build for each other to use and that we use are not simple toys for distraction, uh, but rather tools of synthesis, tools that view the world uh, as being made out of people, 
uh, and therefore that humanity is the first job and that what people want is not just to consume media, but people want to synthesize, people want to make stuff. Not all the time, not at every moment, but when people want to make things, they should have the tools available to do that. And whatever they do with these tools, it should be characterized by deep meaning, uh, and the tools should be amplifiers for your own human intent. And so that's what I think the future ought to be. Thank you. Incredible. Thank you so much, Thank John. You. I don't know about you all, but I've got like a, a page oh. full of notes here. And I'm sure there's a ton of questions for you. We've only got, we've got room for one, though. So I'm going to toss the catch box out to anyone who's got a burning question that they may want to ask. Any takers? All right, I'm tossing this back to you. Nice throw. Very I'm glad accurate. that landed well. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, what is necessary for Oblong to become the apple of the world? Hmm. <laughs> well, I mean, I guess we're, we're testing out that the fitness of that fit uh, right now. It has to be true that more people want to work this way than not. If our theory is wrong and all people want is to watch movies and play Angry Birds, then there's no place for Oblong in the world. But if, on the other hand, the world is actually filled with people who are passionate about their work, who want new ways to build digital and physical experiences, and who like working with one another, like working in teams, like working across distance with other experts whose brains you would love to be on the inside of, then there is a place for Oblong. And not just Oblong, other companies that are working on new UI and that are working on digital systems that are about extending humanity rather than confining humanity in a, a little rectangle. So the, the game is afoot, the test is on, and maybe we'll come back in a year and see how it goes. Amazing. Thanks. Thank you again. One more round of applause, please, for John under Kepler. And I would advise you to stick around and ask him some questions. I'm sure a few of you have a few. Uh,